Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us today on the Aquarium's Facebook Live. My name is Dr. Cara Dodge and I'm a research scientist at the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life at the New England Aquarium. And I think I have one of the greatest jobs on the planet because I get to work with threatened and endangered sea turtles. Now at the aquarium, we work with four different species of sea turtles. We work with the green sea turtle, like our famous resident Myrtle the turtle, who everybody probably misses a lot. Um, and we also work with loggerhead sea turtles and Kemp's Ridleys and the mighty and gigantic leatherback turtle, which I'll be talking about today. Now, in addition to collecting cool and interesting scientific data about these species, we're also doing conservation work. All of these species are either threatened or endangered with extinction. Um, so our work has a lot of applied, um, applied purpose where we're trying to collect data that will actually help um, recover these declining populations. So um, that's one of the reasons my job is so great is I feel like the data we're collecting is actually going to make a difference. Um, so today I'm going to tell you about a project I'm really excited about that we just started last summer. We're working with leatherback sea turtles um, and we're addressing one of the issues they face off of Massachusetts, which is entanglement. Um, so we have some exciting research um, that we're doing with that. And I'm also planning to give everybody an update on Munchkin, who is our loggerhead sea turtle, an adult loggerhead that we released last summer. Um, she's one of the few adult loggerhead turtles that we've seen up here. So she's a really exciting turtle and we have some updates for you on her. So that will be at the end. So please stick around if you're here for Munchkin, <laughs> please stick around for all of the leatherback um, information that I'll be sharing and the Munchkin update will be at the end. Um, I also am uh, going to ask if people have questions, um, please use the comments um, in the Facebook Live to put your questions in. And at the end, I'm going to come back to the webcam and answer hopefully as many of your questions as I can. So with that, we are going to move right into the presentation. And I'm going to start off talking about our leatherback sea turtle research. Um, first, I wanted to give folks a little bit of background about leatherback turtles before we jump right into the research part. Um, I've been working with this awesome behemoth turtle since about 2000. And at first, I was really dealing mostly with dead, stranded leatherback sea turtles. Um, these sea turtles will wash up on the beaches here on Massachusetts. Sometimes they'll float into our coastal waterways. Um, and we learn an awful lot about these turtles by dissecting them and working with dead turtles. Um, but it's certainly not the same thing as working with a live, healthy leatherback. So um, knowing that I got to see very few live leatherbacks back when I first started, uh, my Canadian colleagues actually invited me to come up to Nova Scotia in 2003. And they had an absolutely amazing project happening up there where they were working with fishermen to research live, healthy, free swimming leatherback sea turtles. Um, so I went up there in 2003, and this is the very first live leatherback sea turtle I ever saw. Um, so it was very, very special to me. And um, if I wasn't already hooked on leatherbacks before that trip, I most certainly was after I came home. And we started doing similar at sea studies of leatherbacks off Massachusetts in 2006. And we're still learning new things about leatherback turtles all the time. Um, and it's no secret to people who know me well that leatherbacks are my all-time favorite sea turtle. I know as scientists, we're not supposed to play favorites, but um, leatherbacks are, in fact, my favorite animal. Um, and I've spent the last 15 years chasing them around the Atlantic Ocean and trying to learn their secrets 
which they are very reluctant to give up, um, which of course just makes me love them even more. Now it's hard not to love these turtles. They're really the superlative of the sea turtle world. They're the biggest turtles. The adults can weigh over 1,500 pounds um, and they can be over seven feet long. They have the longest migrations. Um, they can cross the entire Pacific Ocean um, and they travel tens of thousands of kilometers in a single year. They're also the deepest divers. Um, their dives can reach over 1,200 meters, which is almost 4,000 feet underwater or about three quarters of a mile. Um, they're the widest ranging. They can uh, tolerate cold water. So that makes them a little bit different than other sea turtle species. Um, they can actually reach poleward um, further than any other sea turtle. And that's because they have really neat um, anatomical and physiological adaptations that allow them to tolerate cold water. Most sea turtles take on the temperature of their surrounding environment, but the leatherback can actually keep their core body temperature warmer than their surrounding environment. Um, they also are the most mysterious sea turtle. We know essentially nothing about the life stage between these little hatchlings just leaving the nest like you see here, heading towards the water. We almost never see them after that until they're already about four or five feet um, in length and coming back into coastal environments. We really have no idea what these leatherback turtles are doing during those intervening years. Um, so they're very, very mysterious. And they also have the weirdest diet of all sea turtles and really one of the weirdest diets in the animal kingdom. So in this video, you can see what leatherbacks like to eat. And that is jellyfish. These turtles, these gigantic thousand plus pound turtles subsist entirely on a diet of just sea jellies and other gelatinous creatures. So this leatherback here is feeding off of New England on Atlantic sea nettle jellies. And this was a really cool project that I did with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution um, called Turtle Camp. So before I jump into our new research project, that was a little bit of Leatherback 101, um, we, have, we have got to thank our funders. So Massachusetts Environmental Trust has funded this project I'm about to tell you about. And so I want to thank them, but I also want to thank any of you who are buying a specialty license plate in Massachusetts. Your purchase of that license plate is directly funding the Massachusetts Environmental Trust, which is in turn funding um, environmental research projects like this one. We are really grateful for your support. So leatherbacks come to Massachusetts for one reason and one reason only, and that is to eat those jellyfish that you saw in the video. And they are eating constantly. Turtles are munching up to over 60 jellyfish in just one hour, and they're literally gorging themselves to fatten up for seasonal migrations, um, which I described. They can cross entire ocean basin basins, so they need a lot of energy. And for those reproductive females, the mamas who need to nest, um, they, need to, they need all those calories in order to um, produce eggs. So when they come into our busy coastal waterways to feed on those jellyfish, um, they have to navigate a lot of stuff in the water. Um, and that stuff can include fast moving boats. You see in the bottom photo, a boat with a leather back coming to the surface there. Um, it can also include trash or marine debris in the water, and it can also include ropes in the water. And those ropes um, can be associated with a lot of different things, but the majority of ropes in the water here off of Massachusetts are associated with fishing gear. And our project is specifically focused on the threat of entanglement in rope. So ropes or lines in the water column, as you see here on the left, this uh, beautiful diagram that Scott Landry from Center for Coastal Studies put together, shows you the setup. So there's basically a weighted trap on the floor. This could be fishing for lobster or conch or finfish. Um, and it has a rope that attaches to the trap and is, uh, uh, reaches the surface with the buoy. So this is basically a suspended rope in the water column. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, these leatherbacks are really, really big. Um, their flipper span, which is basically their wingspan of their flippers, can be over nine feet. Um, and so those flipper span, that, you know, with a nine foot flipper span, navigating around these ropes in the water column can be really, really tricky. Um, and those flippers can really easily snag on a line that's suspended in the water column. And this can result in an entanglement like you see in the bottom uh, right hand photo. So our friends and collaborators at the Center for Coastal Studies, that's their, their vessel IBIS, um, 
are the lead organization in Massachusetts for documenting and responding to leatherback turtle entanglements. Um, and since 2005, they have documented over 270 leatherback entanglement cases. So we know this is a persistent and potentially a really significant problem for leatherbacks in this area. Um, this map on the right shows all of those entanglement locations. Um, the green circles represent live turtles and the red circles represent dead turtles. And most of these turtles you can see from the green dots um, are still alive when they're first reported. So trained members of uh, what we call the disentanglement network have a really high success rate in completely disentangling these turtles. And this success rate is directly tied to mariners, um, boaters, mostly recreational boaters is the, the biggest source of reports for us. Um, reporting these entanglements, but uh, also standing by the entangled turtles at a safe distance until trained and authorized responders can arrive. And following that protocol essentially guarantees a successful outcome for these turtles. Uh, the Center for Coastal Studies has a toll-free hotline, which you can see on my hat there actually, 1-800-900-3622. Or boaters can also call in these reports um, to the Coast Guard uh, just using VHF channel 16. Standing by is really a critical piece of this. If people report and then leave, it's actually really, really difficult to relocate these turtles because um, so maybe not surprisingly, since they are so strong, they can actually swim with this fishing gear on them. So they can swim away from the area where they're first reported. So the good news is that these turtles are being successfully disentangled. This is a really good thing because these turtles are not strong enough to break these ropes themselves. But one of the lingering issues, um, despite this successful disentanglement program, is that we really don't know the ultimate fate of these turtles once they swim away. So disentangled turtles are released where they're found, so there's still potential for re-entanglement. And turtles can also succumb to their injuries in the days or the weeks after they're released. Um, our Massachusetts Environmental Trust Project is actually allowing us to monitor these disentangled turtles, like this one here, and determine their survivorship after they're released from fishing gear. So this video, courtesy of our colleagues at the Center for Coastal Studies, actually shows what an entangled turtle looks like underwater. You can see the ropes are around the front flippers and the neck area. And this is a pretty typical entanglement configuration for leatherbacks in our region. And this is actually one of our study turtles from last summer that we ended up tagging and monitoring. So I'll be giving you the outcome for this turtle in a little bit. Um, but that is actually a pretty typical um, entanglement configuration that we see. And um, you'll see in just a moment those really long front flippers that these turtles use um, to propel themselves through the water. And you can see how easily such a long flipper um, would be able to snag on some of this um, fishing gear. So for our project, um, to fully understand the outcome for these turtles, we actually use a combination of veterinary health assessment. We have a really skilled team of animal care and veterinary professionals at New England Aquarium. And this is Connie Marigo, the director of our Marine Animal uh, Rescue Program, actually taking a heart rate from a live leatherback. Um, she's actually using a Doppler to get a heart rate off of um, an area on the rear flipper. So we have this great team of veterinary professionals that come out for all of these disentanglement events where we're going to also tag these animals. And they give them a full workup, kind of like if you and I were to go get a physical, very similar. So checking heart rate, respiratory rate, um, and also doing a blood draw. So all of these turtles get their health workup. Um, so we can then later on, hopefully, be able to correlate those health parameters with the outcome for that individual. For the tagging part of our study, um, the primary tag we're using to understand survivorship, which is really our bread and butter tag, is the survivorship pop-up tag. Um, and that's up on the left corner, you can see um, a laptop computer and you can see five of those pop-up tags, getting ready to program those and deploy them. Um, they're quite small, they're about 12 inches long and they are attached with a lanyard, um, which you can see in the photo on the right, to the leatherback's bony ridge, kind of towards the rear of the body. And the way these tags work is that we release them and they're programmed to pop off the turtle after 30 days if the turtle survives. If the tag detects that the turtle has sunk or the turtle is floating, 
the tag will pop off and alert us um, so that we'll know that turtle likely died. So last summer, we got this project off the ground, uh, summer of 2019, and we deployed pop-up tags on four disentangled turtles. Two of those turtles were in Cape Cod Bay. The little inset map shows two green circles in Cape Cod Bay. And two of those turtles were in Nantucket Sound, and you can see those turtles um, at the southern part of the Cape there in the inset map. And the tag pop-off locations are represented by the red triangles. As you can see, some turtles traveled quite far in just 30 days. Um, our results show that one turtle, turtle number two, appeared to have died right after we released it, um, possibly from re-entanglement. And I'll talk about that a little bit more um, in a bit. The other three turtles, num turtles number one, three, and four, survived. Um, and we plan to continue this study in 2020, working with um, our partners in the fishing industry. We worked with this past summer as well as the Center for Coastal Studies and our state and federal government collaborators, just to build up this sample size. Um, four is a great start, but we need to continue to um, add to that data set. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the, the figures on the right here. So this, each of these tags, in addition to um, popping off the turtle and giving us location, also gives us a daily summary of depth and temperature. So on the right, you can see four different plots and each of those, um, it relates to one of those turtles, turtle one, two, three, and four in order. And the dark, dark lines, um, which you can see is actually depth. So that's the turtle's dive depth, um, deepest dive for the day. And I know it's really hard to see because of the tiny little print, but the turtle number two, you can see how different its dive data actually looks from the other ones. Whereas the other turtles you can see are diving to depths um, that exceed you know, 200, 300 meters on some days. Turtle number two, you can see that flat line going across the top. That turtle never actually left um, water that was 10 meters deep, which for a leatherback turtle is really unusual. Um, and that turtle you can see very clearly is not diving at all um, for that period of time where you can see a flat line across the top. So that's the turtle that we think um, very likely was a mortality. So why is this important? Why is it exciting? Um, it's really exciting to me because it provides the first survival data for entangled leatherback turtles, um, which is really, really desperately needed. So right now, um, mortality rate estimates are done, but they are based on expert opinion. So people, uh, experts look at video, photographs, logbook data to try to determine if a turtle um, died from its um, fishing gear entanglement injuries. But there's no real data on which to base those mortality rate estimates. So our goal with this project is um, to actually give real data, put real data into the system, which should actually ultimately improve the management practices um, for these fisheries and hopefully ultimately lead to some bycatch reduction, um, either informing mitigation measures to make the turtles less susceptible to entanglement or hopefully and ideally preventing these entanglements from happening in the first place. So that is our leatherback study. And of course, I'll be happy to answer questions at the end about that, but we're really, really excited about it. Um, and now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about Munchkin. So I know some of you folks are probably on here specifically for Munchkin, and I don't wanna make you wait too long for that update. But for those of you who don't know Munchkin, um, I'm just gonna give a very quick refresher, a um, little introduction. For those of you who don't know who she is, Munchkin was an adult loggerhead sea turtle she stranded on Cape Cod in 2018. And here she is uh, on the day that she was rescued by our friends at Wellfleet Audubon um, during our annual cold stun stranding event on Cape Cod. So every fall, uh, sea turtles will strand um, in Cape Cod Bay because of uh, essentially it's severe hypothermia. So we rescue at the aquarium, we rescue hundreds and hundreds of cold stun sea turtles every year but Munchkin is really unusual. Um, and she's really unusual because she's an adult. Most of the turtles that we handle um, at, our turtle, uh, at our sea turtle hospital are juveniles or very young turtles, maybe one, two, three years old. So they're really quite small, um, but as you can see in this photo, Munchkin is not small at all. Um, she was extremely large, even when she was um, first stranded and underweight, she was still 300 pounds. Um, and it took all hands on deck to actually move her around for her physical exams and for our treatments. Um, so she was just absolutely enormous, very unusual patient for us. 
And if you want to hear more about Munchkin's backstory, for those of you who really don't know, we did a great series of videos on her journey from rescue all the way through rehabilitation and release. So you can find those videos on, uh, if you search Munchkin's journey um, on our New England Aquarium website. So Munchkin's journey did not end um, after rehabilitation. She was ready for release last summer. And in order to ensure that she actually not only survived, but um, ideally reintegrated into the wild population, behaved like a normal turtle, which is how we objectively evaluate the conservation impact of our rescue rehabilitation program here at the aquarium, we put a satellite tag on her shell. And you can see that really nicely in this picture. This is right before she was released. And that tag on her shell is a GPS linked satellite tag. So every time Munchkin surfaces to breathe, that antenna comes out of the water and we're able to actually get um, an exact location or within about 30 meters of where Munchkin is. And that tag also collects and transmits data on temperature and depth. So we know what she's doing. We know what, how, where, how deep she's diving, how cold the water is. So it lets, allows us to really kind of keep an eye on Munchkin um, in this really critical first year post-release. So she was released right before the 4th of July off of Cape Cod Beach, and we've been following her ever since. And this is a really kind of a fun map that brings you along on her track so far. So you'll see at the very top up there in the green dots, that is Munchkin being released from the south side of Cape Cod. You can see she very quickly headed right over towards Long Island. And if you look at the timestamp on the bottom, you can follow along with um, the date of her journey. So at this point, we're in getting towards late July, and she arrives off the mid shelf off of New Jersey. And she actually ended up staying, as you'll see, as the track continues, you'll see that Munchkin really stayed off of New Jersey in a relatively small area for a long, long time. Uh, she actually was off of New Jersey in a, uh, this, this area you see her moving around in now for over three months. Um, and so this was really exciting for her rescuers, those of us monitoring her, because we know from other folks who study loggerheads that this is a really important, really productive loggerhead turtle feeding area. Um, it's really, it's been quite well studied for a number of years. Um, and so we know that uh, Munchkin was basically in an area where she could find lots and lots of food. And this is really critical, especially in this first couple of months post-release, because at this point, Munchkin had been in captivity and rehabilitation for over eight months. And so she had not been feeding on wild prey during that time. We did try to get her ready to do that before she was released, but you just don't know if they're going to be able to figure it out quickly. And Munchkin figured it out very quickly. Um, we can't actually see that she's feeding, but based on her behavior and the dive data showed that she was going right to the bottom um, in this area and loggerhead turtles, especially munchkin size are really kind of honing in on crabs and other bottom dwelling organisms for their food. So you can see munchkin, this is late November now, she made her way south off of North Carolina and she spent over four months off of North Carolina. So this is her overwintering habitat here off of North Carolina. So she left New Jersey when the water started getting too cold. Remember earlier I told you um, turtles other than leatherbacks take on the temperature of their surroundings. So once the water starts getting cold, Munchkin started getting cold and she started moving south. So she moved into warmer water off of North Carolina, but even though she's in warm surface water here, her dive data showed us that she was diving all the way to the bottom and she was getting into water that was as cold as 45 degrees Fahrenheit. So loggerheads are pretty amazing. They can tolerate cold water for short periods of time. Um, and that of course is where they're finding some of these tasty crabs on the bottom. So that's Munchkin's incentive to do these long, pretty deep, um, she could get down to 200 feet um, dives. And some of her dives were actually over two hours long. Um, so just recently, Munchkin started very slowly making her way back north um, and then she went back south. But then the last week or so, she really kind of has started making a move, which you'll see shortly, uh, back up towards the Virginia, North Carolina border. So uh, we're excited to see what she does next. Um, but yes, her dive behavior has been very typical of a healthy wild loggerhead. We compare that data to um, data from turtles that are caught 
for research projects and have not been rehabilitated so that we can see, oh, is she behaving normally and like a wild turtle would? And we're happy to report that indeed Munchkin is doing exactly that. Okay, so that's her last location from yesterday. And as I said earlier, um, Munchkin, we had tried to get her ready for feeding in the wild. So although we cannot actually watch her feeding in the wild, we have a good idea of what it would look like. So this is Munchkin in her rehabilitation tank at the Sea Turtle Hospital in Quincy. And she was towards the end of her rehabilitation started being offered crabs and various other types of foods that would um, be relevant to her um, life in the wild. So you can see just how good loggerheads are at crunching up a really hard bodied prey like a crab. She made short work of those and pretty much was able to decimate them into crab sawdust very quickly. So this is what we think and expect that Munchkin is doing during her travels down off of New Jersey and then more recently off of North Carolina. Isn't she beautiful? Okay. So a lot of our Munchkin fans have been asking us, will Munchkin nest? And we just, we don't actually know the answer to that. The loggerhead nesting season is from April um, through the summer. And so time will tell, uh, Munchkin could nest. We'd be surprised if she nested within the first year of being um, of being rehabilitated, but who knows? We don't know what she's going to do. We hope her tag will last for a full year, which will take us right through July. And if she does nest, we'll be able to see. So that is the update on Munchkin. And now I would be very happy. We're gonna go back into the webcam and I'd be very happy to answer any questions that have come up on the comments. Okay, so let's see what we've got for questions. Um, so our first one from Christy is, do the jellyfish sting the turtles while they try to eat them? That's a great question, Christy, and I get asked that a lot. It's, um, and it's actually one we don't entirely know the answer to. So when you see a leatherback feeding on a jellyfish, you'll actually see some of these large jellyfish, the tentacles streaming back across their faces and even their eyes. Um, and it doesn't seem to bother them. So they must have a way to, and we know um, for ingesting the jellyfish, they must have a way to neutralize the toxins from the stingers because they eat the whole jellyfish, not just the bell. They're eating the stingers too. So we know that they must have a way, at least internally, of neutralizing the venom. But as far as um, an external mechanism for keeping from being stung, we're not sure. Um, we don't see any irritation from those tentacles um, lying all over the turtle's face. So um, it's a it's an area of I think it's an interesting area of research. I think a few people have tried to look at that because there is interest in figuring out for humans how to prevent jellyfish stings, um, and maybe leatherback turtles have the answer to that, but we just don't know what it is yet. Great. So the next question is kind of a combination question from Penelope and Christy again. Um, how long do turtles survive in the wild, and how long do they survive in captivity? That's a great question. So Penelope and Kristen, in the wild, um, some sea turtles uh, have been, I think, recorded nesting for, gosh, let me see. I think there have been like 40 or 50 year data sets. Um, so we know turtles because they are very late to mature and reproduce. Um, in some species, it's as late as 30 years. We know that they are probably quite long lived in the wild um, just because they don't reproduce until such an old age. Um, but it's really hard to age some of these turtles. Leatherbacks in particular are really difficult to age. Um, but we think that they can probably live in the wild for at least 50 to 60 years. Um, and some of those other species probably longer. Um, and in captivity, I think the oldest turtle, sea turtle in captivity, um, I want to say it was a green turtle and that she was maybe 90 or even close to 100. So in captivity, they probably live longer just because they're not, um, you know, they're able to conserve a lot more energy and they're not dealing with as much, um, as many threats and as many issues. So their lives are a little bit easier. Well, that's cool. The Great next question. question is from Charlene who asks, is there something other than rope that fishers slash lobster trappers can use that won't cause entanglement like a breakaway type of rope? 
That's a great question too. So there's a lot of interest um, in figuring out how to get either get rid of that line or modify that line. And a lot of that has been driven by um, the, the endangered North Atlantic right whales. You know, that there's a population of whales right here off of New England that numbers 400. Um, and they also get entangled in these ropes. And so a lot of the research has been driven by that. Um, and really what they're, um, I think, the solution that a lot of folks want is just getting rid of the rope entirely. And so there is some prototype ropeless fishing gear um, that's being uh, tested now, um, really because of right whales. But that if that actually goes into effect and is wide, used in a widespread way, that could obviously benefit um, sea turtles as well. But we're probably many years away from that um, actually happening. So in the meantime, we need to think of other creative solutions. There are breakaway buoys and things like that, again, um, geared towards ray whales. Um, and unfortunately, those breakaways are just, they're too strong for the turtles to break away. Um, we actually have seen turtles entangled with those breakaway uh, buoy lines. So we need to think of something that will um, obviously work for the turtles, but also work for the fishermen who need the rope to be a certain strength to haul it up out of the water safely. Okay, so... Um, Sander asks, does the population of North America cross the Atlantic Ocean to go to Europe or North Africa? That's a great question, too. Um, so it's interesting. Some turtles that have been tagged on the nesting beaches in the, Atl in the northern Atlantic. So most of those nesting beaches are either in the Caribbean or Central America or South America. Um, a lot of those turtles have actually crossed over uh, crossed the Atlantic on the um, north side. So they've crossed over to Europe. Um, and uh, let's see, the turtles that we've tagged here, none of them have actually crossed the entire Atlantic. They've crossed the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, but we have not actually tracked a turtle all the way across the Atlantic from New England. Uh, but we do know that this population of turtles can cross the entire Atlantic. Um, they rarely cross the equator, the North Atlantic population. We think the North Atlantic and the South Atlantic leatherback populations are separate populations genetically, um, and we have not seen the satellite tagging data does support um, the genetics that show that they seem to be different subpopulations. All right. So another kind of combination question from Karen and Chris are, what are some of her, I think they mean munchkin, some of her or turtles natural predators? Oh, that's a great question. So turtles, little baby turtles, those little, I showed you that picture of the turtle on the nesting beach, those are about the size of your palm um, and everything wants to eat them. So at that age, um, they have a ton of predators and it could be seabirds, it could be fish, it could be crabs on the beach while they're emerging. So um, very few of those little turtles actually grow up into big, um, healthy, reproductive age turtles. Um, but once they're adult sized, sea turtles actually don't have a ton of predators. Um, what actually will eat an adult sea turtle is um, there are several species of large shark. So great white sharks, bull sharks, tiger sharks, those kind of very large bodied sharks, um, as well as killer whales will also um, go after sea turtles as well. Um, but yes, some of their predators on the nesting beach, once they're adults and they come back to nest, can include um, you know wild dogs, uh, things like uh, in Costa Rica, they've actually seen adult turtles attacked by um, wild cats. Um, so jaguars and things like that. Um, so they do face, um, you know, a few a few predators as well as adults once they start um, coming up on the nesting beach. But I mean, their their biggest threat is probably, unfortunately, human beings. Great. So kind of a follow up to that is from Ray. If she does, where would Munchkin likely nest? Oh, that's a good question too. So when we had Munchkin in house, we actually sent a genetic sample, a blood sample to our colleague, Brian Shamblin at the University of Georgia. And Brian um, studies the Georgia and the Carolina populations of loggerhead turtles. So he has this really extensive genetic database and she was not a match for any of those, um, anything, anyone in his database. So if she does nest, she could either be a real surprise to um, to us and nest in the uh, Carolinas or Georgia, but it's unlikely based on Brian's database. So possibly Florida. Um, we'll just have to wait and see. April is the very beginning of loggerhead nesting season. So what she does over the next month is going to tell us a lot about whether or not she's going to nest this, this year. That is super exciting. 
So, Pro, the last question we have time for is from yes. Madison and Ben. How far out in the ocean can turtles go? How far out in the ocean? They basically, the ocean to a sea turtle is like a bathtub to us. They can go out right into the middle of the ocean. They do exactly that. We've tracked leatherback turtles from Cape Cod who have just swum right past Bermuda out into the middle of the ocean and spent the entire winter out there. So they really treat whole ocean basins as their home range, um, which is amazing. Uh, leatherback turtles can swim across the entire Pacific Ocean, which is huge, massive. Um, and, you know, it's for them, it's just normal. Um, it's just part of their very, very extensive habitat um, range. So, yeah, they really have very few limits other than um, those temperature limits I talked about earlier. All right, I think that'll do it for us. If you want to wrap it up. Okay, great. Thanks everyone.